your honor. The silence ship battle is one of the ones that is a very elaborate scene to shoot. It was so well conceived by Mark. The whole thing was very wisely centered around Apilu's performance, Gemma's performance, and Alfie's performance. I tried to stay with individuals within the chaos of the boat battle, and then it was the decision as to who we follow. Initially, it was all about Gemma's character, Yara, but uh, in shooting it, Pilo's Euron was such fun. Pilo is such an incredibly charismatic, he's such a great kind of heir apparent to Ramsey, he's such a great baddie for this season, and so fantastically physical. <laughs> Euron was just like analyzing how many people do I have to kill, and what do I have to do now? But the first hit, and blood just came out. And you know, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I don't know if I can say fucking, but that was a fucking awesome week. Acting alongside Pilu is such a joy, because we have a great respect for how tricky it all is in terms of the physicality and he's so respectful of anything that will or won't hurt but I'm also very game for him to go for it so it's convincing so between us we work very well together and we communicate very clearly with one another before we're doing things what we're doing and how we're doing it and that's how we've managed to stay safe. Silence is supposed to be a very different kind of boat. It's the mother ship, it's his um, command ship, and it's supposed to intimidate people when they see it, and it's supposed to strike fear into the hearts of his enemies. The boat itself is a, is a projection of the personality of the man who built it. It's a big fuck you boat built by a big fuck you guy. My ship's like five times bigger than their little tiny boat. You know, it was just, this, it was like, their boat was this big and mine was this big. And I don't think it has nothing to do with, you know, you know what they say about guys with big cars. They like speed, and so do I. The boat itself doesn't really come into play as, as, as a real thing that people need to interact with until it's connected to Yara's ship. And so we decided that the best way to really put across the true size of this boat was to build a section of it, the bow section that rams into uh, Yara's boat. We designed a big naval ram um, that was on the front of that boat that would then crash into Yara's. And that was an opportunity to then reintroduce the Kraken. And obviously also we had the, the Corvus itself that could also you know, be this very aggressive thing that then all latches onto her ship. And the Corvus is uh, the long walkway that descends and smashes onto Yara's ship. And they often would be built with these kind of claws on the bottom so that they, when they hit the deck of the enemy ship, they would stay there. We built the, the Corvus so that it was became lightweight and, and very strong. The trouble we had was the fact that we had a stuntman standing on the end, which meant that we had to control it with a winch system. But the winch system was obviously a control fall, so we went, ended up managing to double the speed in the end, which made it more, more dramatic. Fire is one of the hardest things for VFX to, to replicate, and so they'd always rather have real fire on set. Even now, with all the advances in visual effects technology, real fire just looks better. We created um, ember guns. We had um, a couple of moments where uh, like a projectile would go crashing through a mast, and the whole sort of section of the mast would come collapsing down. So we had big drop rigs up in the, um, in the rigging. During the battle, where they fired the burning projectiles at the you know, Yara's crew. Our effect there is really uh, flares fired down wires. Archer. One of the major challenges in the boat sequence was how to, you know, sell the idea that this was happening at sea, that they were floating on water and yet we're in a car park in Northern Ireland. The visual effects process and bringing a scene to life that doesn't really exist in a real practical world, um, takes a lot of creativity and imagination. 
Uh, the most challenging aspect of the, the sea battle is the number of shots. It's a very quick cut scene, and it's about the pacing, and it's fast. I mean, it's like a, it's like a machine gun. We had green screens 60 feet high all the way around the ship. So there isn't really a direction that the camera can face that we don't have to do something. The boat at Banbridge is quite restrictive. You know, we had 40 stunt guys on there, six cast members and the crew. Um, so that was quite a challenge, you know, and it was very wet and it was very cold. The set itself became almost comically crowded with everybody doing this dance. We agreed that the violence should be brutal and feel unchoreographed, that it shouldn't feel structured. I wanted it to feel like the violence uh, of a riot or football terraces when there's a flat, you know, a flash of, you know, violence and it just kicks off. In a lot of fight choreography, it's, it, it's, it's challenging to, to achieve that if you're trying to do a specific spike beats. Um, and also long takes by their nature make people exhausted. So one of the things that we did to achieve that was no take was more than 10 seconds long. So all we were asking the, the cast and the stunts to do was to go nuts for 10 seconds. Hugely challenging for everybody. Difficulties of filming on a wooden boat in the rain because it gets so slippy. Chicken wire was stapled to the floor to stop us from slipping over and like, you know, there's so much going on out of shot. It was just insane because there's so many people. You know, like I mean it's very different when you're practicing like one-on-one -on -one with like a with a stunt double or with like another actor the day before in a stunt tent to when you like get there on the day and they're like, oh by the way. We didn't mention, like, you can't stand here because this is on fire and, like, we're going to flood the boat and, like, don't slip over and you're on a deck. You're like, oh, OK. So it's, like, a lot of things to consider. The key moment, I suppose, for me at least, uh, in the sequence is Yara coming up onto the poop deck area and really that, that moment of looking out over the stern of her ship and, and seeing the enormity of the, uh, the attack and, and knowing that all is lost, really, and that uh, the only thing to do is to, you know, fight to the last, uh, like a good Iron Islander. When Yara gets taken by Euron on the boat and it has the axe to her throat, Initially, she feels like Theon's back, it's OK, he'll do something, he'll do the right thing. And then the change that happens in his eyes, she realises that he's not going to stay. I think she's heartbroken at that point. And it really all comes down to close-ups on three people and they're, where they're at at the end of this experience. We would maybe fooled ourselves into thinking that Theon was out of the woods on his whole Reek experience, and as we were writing it, we realized that you don't just get over what happened to him. That's something that's like that's going to be a part of him for the rest of his life. And this is a place that that triggers the the worst of that experience as he sees people around him doing the kinds of things that Ramsey used to do to him, and to see Euron's pure psycho glee about the whole thing. And when Theon jumps overboard, that laugh is, that's the character's encapsulation is that shot that, you know, that's why this is somebody you should be worried about. <laughs>